mentoring others. Spiritual leaders should develop a core of faithful men and women who can multiply their efforts. Here's Dr. Gene Getz. This principle is directly related to why Paul left Timothy in Ephesus. He had a great challenge in front of him, dealing with false teachers. And so consequently, uh, Paul addressed him in terms of this task, and uh, he said this, hold on to the pattern of sound teaching that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Those are key phrases, key words, a pattern of sound teaching. And another way he expressed it is the good deposit through the Holy Spirit. What is that deposit? Well, if you go back to the upper room when Jesus was meeting with the apostles, just a short time before his crucifixion, their hearts were troubled. And he said, look, I'm going to go away. I'll come again. But in the meantime, I'm going to send you another counselor, another encourager. He's called the Spirit of Truth. And three times there in the upper room, Jesus told the apostles, those 11 men, because Judas has now left the scene, that he was going to send the Holy Spirit, another counselor, another encourager. And Jesus went on to say that when he comes, and he's referring now to these men, he said, he will bring to your remembrance everything I've taught you while I've been here on this earth. But, he said, the Holy Spirit will also guide you into all truth, all truth. And that really began to happen in a very unique way on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came there in Jerusalem, and Peter began to preach and to teach and referred to the Old Testament, but then went on to teach additional truth that God was revealing to him through the Holy Spirit. And it says that they continued in the apostles' teaching. What was the good deposit? What is the good deposit? Well, it came to us primarily through the apostles. We have it in our New Testament today, which is the apostles' teaching. So the apostle Paul, of course, was a part of giving us that wonderful deposit of truth through the letters that he also wrote, the 13 letters that we have in our New Testament. So Paul is saying to Timothy, guard that good deposit. He's addressing Timothy in relationship to these false teachers who were not teaching the truth. They were not following the good deposit of truth, the pattern of sound teaching. And so Paul then goes on to describe the process that uh, God has designed in order to guard that good deposit, in order to communicate, to deal uh, with false teachers as well as to help people to grow and, and be nurtured uh, in Jesus Christ. So we read about it right at the beginning of chapter 2. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And when he says therefore, he's saying it has, it's going to take strength to guard that good deposit and to teach that truth that you need to teach. And so it goes on to say, what? You have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now, here the translators uh, took this as a, uh, a reference to a specific gender. In this particular case, it's translated faithful men. There's a possibility it could be translated faithful people because in other passages of Scripture, uh, in Titus, for example, Paul talks about uh, faithful men and women, committing to faithful men and women who will be able to uh, continue to teach and to give direction to people who need to grow in their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's why this principle is worded this way, because it's based on the whole biblical story as we see it in the New Testament. Spiritual leaders should develop a core of faithful men and women who can multiply their efforts. Now, Timothy had a twofold task. The first part of that task was to confront false teachers who were departing from that good deposit of truth. But secondly, he was to equip faithful teachers. 
And this leads, I think, to a twofold lesson that we can learn from this whole process and from Timothy's life and from Paul's words. Here it is. First, we can get so bogged down confronting and correcting those who are walking out of the will of God that we neglect to equip those who are walking in the will of God. And so there's got to be balance here. And Paul is balancing that. And that relates to the second lesson. Second, this proactive approach will multiply our efforts in eliminating false teaching. We need both. And so Paul is saying you need to develop faithful men and women who will be able to communicate the truth and counteract this false doctrine. Which leads us to a reflection and response question, and that is what are some practical ways we can discover faithful men and women and then equip them to minister to others? Well, if we could have a discussion on that, I'm sure we could come up with a lot of practical ideas. But for me, as I reflect on the answer to that question, it's this. Look for people who are faithful in small things. That's very important. If they're faithful in small things, normally they will be faithful in bigger things. And look for those people who are faithful in what we might consider small things, and of course, in the sight of God, there isn't such a thing as a small thing. <laughs> God looks at every effort, everything that is done is important in His sight when it's done in His will. But uh, from a practical point of view, we can define small things, little things, and people are faithful in those little things. And then look for how people respond in a small group, for example. Uh, you can spot people quickly who have potential to serve, people who are faithful in small things. And you can see they have great potential because they're eager to serve the Lord, and they respond, uh, which really leads to another suggestion, and that is um, look at how people respond to positive feedback. You see, positive feedback will bring the best out of people in terms of responding to being able to respond to uh, things that are even difficult. I remember very clearly, and as I was reflecting on this question, uh, this practical question, I, I thought about the fact I must have been about 12 years old. And in my own religious background in that church, I was asked to get up in front of the congregation to read a poem. I remember working hard on how to read that poem, and uh, I got up and read it. But I'll never forget that one of the older gentlemen in the church, who was one of the primary teachers, came up to me afterwards and just simply say, I want to thank you, and you have talent. You have some talent. And I don't think he ever knew how much that meant to me. Frankly, I don't think I ever told him. Uh, I should have, but I never forgot that because it really made me believe in myself. It really made me feel like God had created me for something specific, that I was unique because I was made in God's image. And that really came home to me when I entered Moody Bible Institute, when I really didn't believe in myself. And a pastor, professor, teacher uh, believed in me when I didn't believe in myself and gave me positive feedback and said, you have talent, you have skill, you have potential. And that drew the best out of me because I believed, yes, I am unique in God's sight. I can make a contribution. And I will be forever grateful for the way in which that ministered in my life. So let's uh, remember that this is a very important principle to live by in terms of ministry. Let me restate it. Spiritual leaders should develop a core of faithful men and women who can multiply their efforts.